It's great to be here, and I'm, I'm just so glad to be joining everyone uh, for this for this seminar and have the opportunity to talk to you about the heart, Hildebrand's uh, view of affectivity. So um, again, I'm only going to uh, be just almost scratching the surface here, but I would like to um, consider one divergence in the views of Hildebrand and Aquinas and one element of convergence. So I'll begin with the first with the element of, of divergence as I see it. Um, now I have heard um, there's a little bit of a rumor that, that Father James Brent may, may prove me wrong <laughs> on this point of divergence and I would be delighted if that were the case. But I'll go ahead with this. So Aquinas, um, as, as Beth, we heard Beth already tell us, Aquinas uses the terms, so passions uh, for the sensible appetite, the experience of the sensible appetite and affections that refer to the spiritual appetite. And for my purposes, I'm not going to distinguish them, okay? We're just going to consider the, the passions in general in, in Aquinas, okay? And so he considers the passions to be these movements of, you could say, of the appetite, whether sense, the sensitive appetite or the intellectual appetite, he says, towards some beloved object, towards, towards some desired object, or conversely, away from some object that is, um, is, is repulsing. So we're, I'm just going to not always distinguish those two, all right, but there, that, those are always the two, you always have the positive and the negative, okay, so for every positive passion you have an, a negative counterpart. Okay, so then we saw that there are the two kinds of passions, the concupiscible, um, the ones that belong to the concupiscible appetites and the ones that belong to the irascible appetites. Okay, and I'm just going to list them again. Uh, because it's going to be important to notice something about them. We have, um, for the concupiscible appetites, these are the um, variations. We have six variations on the tendency towards some something perceived as good, or the tendency away from something perceived as evil. So we have love and hate, desire and aversion, and then delight and distress. And the irascible ones are hope and despair, confidence and fear and anger. Now, the thing to note, which is going to be important for my presentation, for the contrast, is that the passions, at least so far understood, have, as it were, one note, okay? They kind of have one theme to them, and it's the following. They're related in one way or another to the agents, to an agent's union with some desired good, okay? That seems to be the theme of the passions for, for Aquinas. They're related in one way or another to the agent's union with a desired good, right? Hope, fear, distress, and so forth. And this is perhaps why the term desire is very often used interchangeably with the term for emotions. There's a, a book that was written uh, within the last few years called The Logic of Desire, and the book is on the emotions in Aquinas. You see that the term desire is often used because it has to do with the agent's desire for some good. So this means that um, the passions have a more or less instrumental character for Aquinas. Now I say more or less because he says that the, the primary passion is love, and he says, um, and, and then the final passion is resting in the beloved object. But all the others have to do with being on the way to the desired object or somehow keeping away from an object that is evil, okay? So in some sense, they also aren't desirable in their own right. They're destined to be fulfilled and realized and therefore dissolved in union with the desired object, right? Hope eventually should give way to uh, being in union with the desired object, okay? Fear should eventually be overcome through an accomplishing of the separation from the feared object, okay? So in that sense, they aren't something that is really desirable in, in, in their own right. Now, of course, the exception to this is resting in the beloved object. And, um, and the initial uh, uh, passion of love also um, is, is meant to ultimately be fulfilled in resting in the beloved object. Okay, so I want to, I want to um, contrast then Hildebrand's view of emotions on this one particular point. Okay, so for Hildebrand, I'm going to first of all um, 
limit myself to speaking about what he calls the genuinely spiritual affective responses. And I'm grateful that those have already been described earlier. So there are, there are emotions that we have that are of a lower kind, but I'm going to consider the genuinely spiritual affective emotions. These for, for um, Hildebrand are the archetype of, of the emotional. They're the highest level or the highest um, ca capacity of the heart is revealed in these genuinely spiritual affective responses. For Hildebrand, these responses are greatly meaningful in their own right. Okay, in other words, they are, they are desirable in and of themselves. And he tells us that in the affective responses, there is accomplished a unique, a completely unique, by comparison with the will and the intellect, an irreducible aspect of what he calls, it's a very beautiful phrase he uses, he says, the human person's great dialogue with reality. Okay, so the drama of human existence is to engage more and more with reality, to respond properly, to conform, to receive the gift of reality, to engage in this great dialogue. And he says the heart affords us a way of responding and relating to reality, which is unsubstitutable, the intellect and the will um, do that also. They do engage us with reality in very important ways. But he says, without the heart, the heart isn't just like icing. It's not just the overtones of knowledge. It is not just something that gives us a sort of overtone of acting and willing. It actually has its own content uh, and something which um, greatly adds to the transcendence of the human person. And he, he here thinks that the loftiest potential of the heart is, is actually discovered and revealed. Okay, so what I want to do first is I'm going to um, dig into that a little bit more. And um, I want to begin by giving some examples of, of these effective responses. I'll just quickly run through a quote. He says, this fear includes an act of forgiveness, the holy joy over the conversion of a sinner, as well as the meek acceptance of great humiliation. Here we encounter the moral value of an unshakable confidence of a noble compassion, moving humility, and freedom proper to deep contrition. Here we find the most sublime of all human acts, the adoring love of God and charity to, towards one's neighbor. And then he tells us also, you find different forms of wickedness here, the meanness of envy, of malicious joy, of poisonous hatred, and so forth. Okay, so he tells us, then Hildebrand tells us that in the heart, we actually respond to reality in what we could call a fully material way. He says the voice of the heart is a new voice, okay? The person says something in response to reality that they don't say with the intellect or with the will, okay? And so he tells us that it, it, um, it has its own character and its own content. Okay, so now what we need to do is see what is the character of these genuinely effective spiritual responses that makes them unique. We begin with their intentionality, and I'm so happy that the groundwork has been laid for that. That's a very, very important point, that um, emotional eff effective responses are intentional. That means that they're the content of the effective response is meaningfully related to the content. That means the intelligibility and the meaning of the object. Okay, there's a very deep correlation. Now, so, so there's a, 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 a deep spirituality to affective responses. Now, um, we find this, that this is the case with knowledge as well. Okay, knowledge is, is intentional. It's very easy to see that. What's going on in the world is found then, you could say, within the intellect, all right, there's a very deep correspondence, but it's not like, my mind is not like wax that's impressed somehow with a stamp. No, there's a deep grasping, a deep relationship of the, the act of the mind with the meaning within the object. So we also have that in knowledge. So what is different about the affective response? Well, he tells us that um, in the, the act of knowledge is purely receptive. What is happening within the intellect, in a sense, strictly mirrors what is going on in reality. But in the case of the affective response, he says there's something spontaneous going on, which means that the per there's a new content within the person. And he says there's a new word that is spoken in response to reality. So while the response 
is deeply correlated to the reality. So you have an event, a joyful event. The joy within the person deeply correlates with what is going on in the world. He says, but more is going on. It's not just a mirroring of what's there. He says, I speak a word in response to that event. He calls it a completing word. Somehow there's a completion. Now I would say, he doesn't say this, but I would say there's a completion of the dialogue. I, in a sense, go out of myself and give something in response to that reality. He speaks of a meaningful concerting with the object in its intelligibility. So there is an actual content in the affective response. So it's not just a kind of vibrating with reality. Some authors speak of it that way, the kind of overtones of my knowledge of the world, but there's a new content. And um, to see this, I'd like to, again, now consider, go back to considering some very important affective responses. Think of gratitude. The entire content of gratitude is found in the movement of the heart. Repentance. Of course, with our will, we can, we can say that we want to repent, but repentance actually occurs within the heart. We can disavow our sins will, willingly, but we need the heart for genuine repentance. Forgiveness. Christ tells us, unless you forgive from the heart, you will not be forgiven. The entire content of adoration, again, is found in the heart. There's no act of the will, which is if you take will in the narrow sense of choosing. Okay, so these, these full realities then are um, add something very new in, 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 in this dialogue of the person with reality. They are not just merely instrumental. They're not just about desiring something. They're not just about getting us to the desired object, which is more or less what they are for Aquinas. Okay, there again, it's very difficult to put into words. He says a meaningful concerting with the value that we find in the world. Okay, so I have just a couple of minutes to um, discuss the convergence here. And, and I'm going to do this since I only have very little time. What I would like to do is read to you a few very um, telling and very uh, important quotes. First, I'll read one from Hildebrand and then a couple from Aquinas. And this is the point that I want to make. It seems as though in Aquinas, and I, I just want to say that I, I don't know Aquinas very well on this topic, right? I'm just beginning my invest investigations of him. But I find over and over and over again that in Aquinas, there seems to be evidence that he also considers the heart to be, in some sense, at the core of the, per of the person. We're going to hear a talk tomorrow that Hildebrand considers the heart the true self. I think that um, Aquinas seems to think that as well. And I don't think he just means it in the, in the broad sense, the heart to stand for the depth of the person. I think he even means it in the sense of being the affective core of the person. So the affective core for him seems sometimes to coincide with the real core of the person. So um, I'll read just a few lines from Hildebrand. He says, the heart here is not only the true self because love is essentially a voice of the heart. It is also the true self insofar as love aims at the heart of the beloved in a specific way. The lover wants to pour his love into the heart of the beloved. He wants to affect his heart, to fill it with happiness. And only then will the lover feel that he has really reached the beloved self. Okay. So now by way of um, a, a friendly comparison here, I want to read two quotes from Aquinas. Aquinas says, it is observed that four proximate effects may be ascribed to love, melting, enjoyment, languor, and fervor. Notice all of these are affections. And this would be Hildebrand's, I would say, the, the uh, being affected. He says, of these first is melting, which is opposed to freezing. For things that are frozen are closely bound together so as to be hard to pierce. But it belongs to love that the, the appetite is fitted to receive the good which is loved, inasmuch as the object love is in the lover, as stated above. So, so you can see here that all of these affections are central to receiving the beloved. 
So he says, consequently, the freezing or hardening of the heart is a disposition incompatible with love, while menting denotes a softening of the heart, whereby thy heart shows itself to be ready for the entrance of the beloved. Okay, so the, the beloved is, is actually received where, for Aquinas, into the heart of the lover. So um, I would just like to read um, one, one more quote, and then this will be, then I'll be finished. For the love of concupiscence, he says, is not satisfied with any external or superficial possession or enjoyment of the beloved, but seeks to pos possess the beloved perfectly by penetrating into his heart, as it were. And in the response of the same question, he says, the beloved is contained in the lover by being impressed on his heart and thus becoming the object of his complacency. On the other hand, the lover is contained in the beloved inasmuch as the lover penetrates, so to speak, into the beloved. So with that, I, I hand the baton to Father James Brent. Thank you.